All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Here we are. I found a really cool cave uh, that I think might be similar to that of the others. Um, it's, it's a big cavernous kind of a limestone cave. Not a lot of stalactites and stalagmites right in here, but there are some in front of me that you can't see. Okay. So anyway, we uh, last time we saw that uh, Kimba found the Pleasant Valley, that wonderful place that had great uh, hunting with many herds, beautiful area. It's, it's a safe place for the tribe to live and be able to hunt, but he's got to convince them to go there and he's got to get back to uh, through the cave here. So he's got to go back through the cave and get past the others. He said he was going to figure something out because he remembers something Utrecht taught him. Do you remember what that was? Well, let's see if you're right. Chapter 17. In the blackness, Kimba and the dog followed the narrow trail of sticky mud that skirted the lake. His foot dislodged a pebble, but he heard no splash, so they were beyond the lake. It had not seemed so enormous walking around it. In fact, he realized the lake was not really very large at all. Swimming in its cold waters, possessed by fear of the others, he had greatly magnified its size in his own mind. Again, they traversed the maze of tunnels down which they had fled their pursuers. Finally, they peeped into the chamber where the others lived. Enough moonlight shone so that Kimba could perceive the mounds of snoring bodies. An arm or leg stirred at times, but he could see no one standing up or moving about. Yet there must be a lookout, and possibly many more of the others would be awake or partially awake. His own people, and Nupas too, he had noticed, did not sleep soundly the entire duration of the night. Instead, they would sleep for a relatively brief period and then awaken for a similar period. This was their pattern throughout the night. This was how they obtained their rest, but never left themselves totally vulnerable to whatever the night might bring. Kimba can actually do that now that he has uh, uh, the dog with him. He imagined it was the same with the others. Someone moved on the ledge just outside the entrance. It was a lookout shifting his weight. Were there two? Kimba could see no one else. On tiptoe, he threaded his way among the sleepers. The dog followed, silent as fog. Kimba tried to quiet his breath. His plan was a good one, or so it had seemed during the day, but now... It had to succeed, or these creatures would rise up and seize him in an instant. And they wouldn't talk to him. They would just kill him first. He kept his eyes on the lookout. That would be the test of his plan. Kimba knew he would stand no chance if the guard or anyone else lying here awake should be too alert or too courageous. But the lookout's close-set eyes were focused dreamily on the clouds framing the low-hanging moon. All was well. Then Kimba stepped on the hand of one of the others. The man cried out, shooting to a sitting position. The lookout whirled. Kimba crutched, I'm sorry, Kimba crouched, almost hidden in the gloom. The lookout and the man who had been awakened stared at the wild dog. It glowed in the dark, huge, glimmering, spectral. The man on the floor gurgled in fear, raising a hand to shield himself. The lookout shrank back. Tor, he whispered. The rest had awakened. They saw the dog, and there were gasps and moans of horror. Kimba dashed for the entranceway. The dog sprang after him. Tor, the lookout whispered again, flattening himself against the granite wall of the mountainside, letting them pass. Behind, many more were breathing the word Tor, Tor. It had worked, Kimber rejoiced, as he and the dog skittered down the slope. The others had been too terrified to try to stop them. It was good that he, he had thought of Utrecht and the ghostly glittering costume the sorcerer wore. Before he had left the Great Valley, Kimba had gathered the moss-like foxfire from the base of a dead, decaying spruce tree. He had rubbed it over the dog's hairy coat. To the others, the animal must have resembled 
an apparition, a ghostly in- enemy, an evil power they could not grapple with. So that's how he did it. He remembered uh, Utrecht's mask, and he remembered the Foxfire Moss uh, stuff that is on uh, de- dead or decaying trees, and it glows when you spread it on you. So he spread it on the dog and made the dog glow in the dark. By sunrise, they had reached the foot of the mountain. Kimba gazed back up to the tiny speck that was the portal to the cave. He would, some, he would come back here and lead his tribe to that pleasant, game-filled valley. He must remember every detail of the landscape. From this point at the base of the Forbidden Mountains, it would be, he judged, three full days and perhaps half of another until he would be back with the tribe. But he would hurry and attempt to cut that time. We go to Rab now, he shouted to the dog. It is too late for Rab, was the thought that came instantly to his mind. It was as though a voice, a sneering voice, such as Sabo's, had said it. Go, Kimba said aloud to this thought. He would not consider it. It would not make its home with him. He had told Nupa that he must continue to believe that Rab could still be saved. And he meant it. He must continue to believe that the piece of tusk could work its cure. He must believe this, and so he would. They saw no game that day, though the dog ranged widely, disappearing for long periods. Kimba settled for roots and edible grasses, but did not feel sorry for himself as he lay down to sleep that night within a small enclosure of rocks that he had hastily built. By now, he thought the tribe must have found meat. Very likely, Utrecht had managed to summon a gigantic herd of bison or reindeer, and the hunters would have had great success. There were probably stacks of meat in the cave, and they would welcome him back with a hearty feast. He saw himself sinking his teeth into a tender broiling haunch. That was his last waking thought, and his first the next morning. Shortly after midday, a fallow deer crossed their path. It had been maimed by some predator and could run on only three legs. The dog gave chase and brought the animal to earth. Kimba had sliced off only a small chunk of meat when a dozen gray wolves appeared. The pack was lean and ravenous, and Kimba saw that he and the dog would be no match for it. They pulled back hastily and left the rest of the meat to the wolves but they had eaten enough to keep them uh, moving briskly along. They spent that night in a snug sinkhole in the chalky clay adjoining a forest. The following day, they went once more without meat, but there were roots and tender new willow leaves to munch on. Kimba was loping much of the time now, and at dusk, he was filled with energy, reluctant to halt. The stars were out when at last he erected a ring of boulders around them. On the third day of the journey from the mountains, the sun blazed as if it were the heart of summer. Kimba began to see land he knew well. There was a rolling meadow where he had once watched Rab run down and slay a wild boar. Here was a thin belt of pines where he had amazed the tribe by softly hooting at an owl until it flew down to him and brushed his cheek with its wing. That night he slept little. He squirmed with excitement, knowing how close he was to the tribe. Again and again he stroked the magic piece of tusk. If only the morning would come, kind of like you guys on uh, Christmas Eve, probably, when you're trying to sleep before Christmas. Somewhere close by, two mighty cats, saber-tooths perhaps, coughed and spit at each other, then roared with the fury of open combat. The dog's ears perked up, but the sound of the battle did not disturb Kimba. He had the piece of ivory for Rab. Nothing would prevent his return now. Dawn was faint on the horizon when Kimba arose. By the time the moon had paled to invisibility, he had traveled far from the shelter of rocks where they had passed the night. He stepped along rapidly, and where the earth was level enough, he sprinted. Far in the distance, he suddenly observed the bluff, which jutted up over the tribe's cave. It was pink and shiny in the bright light of the morning sun. Just then, the dog streaked after a hare. Come, Kimba called to it. There was no need of this. There would be... uh, 
food soon when they reached the cave. Come, he called again. For the first time, he realized it would be good to have a name to call the dog. He recalled what the terrified others had said when they saw the animal gleaming in the darkness. Tor. Kimba did not understand their tongue. Tor. What did, it, what did that mean to the others? Spirit? Or devil? Or ghost? He did not know. He only knew it must be their name for something awesome and frightening. Tor. It had a good sound to it. He cupped his hands to his mouth and shouted once more to the dog, Come, Tor! Come, Tor! So now the dog has a name, Tor! I like it. The hare skimmed away into, a thick, and into the thick rushes along a brook. The dog turned back and hurried up to the boy. Tor, said Kimba. He thumped the dog's shoulders. Tor, he repeated. Tor was his friend, and Tor would be welcomed by the tribe, Kimba told himself. True, some might be distrustful to begin with, just as they had been with Kimba. Odd lag would not be friendly, and many would have to learn to change their beliefs. Change their beliefs? Is that what people do? Hmm, maybe. But he would describe to them how much the dog had meant, how it had stayed with him when he had secured the one tusk's ivory and how it had helped him to find the great valley. They would understand, and so Tor, too, would be rewarded with a plentiful share of meat and would remain with the tribe from this day forward. Kimba could not stop himself from running. Every rock, every tree, every grassy swelling of the earth was known to him. At any moment, he was sure he would see some of the tribe. The cliff was overhead now, and before him gaped the wide entranceway to the cave where he lived. Kimba paused. The well-worn stretch of ground in front was deserted. Perhaps the men were hunting, he thought. He started forward, but the women and children should be outside. Could they have been frightened by some animal, he wondered. Perhaps they were remaining inside until the hunters returned. It is Kimba, he shouted as he approached. No one answered. He halted outside the entrance way and hollered again. Still, there was no reply. Erda, he called. You trek, he called. Only silence greeted him. It is Kimba, he shouted, and he entered the cavern. There was no one there. He went back out into the sunshine. You trek, Erda, he cried out, knowing it was hopeless. His voice echoed briefly, then died away. He should have known, he chided himself. The tribe would move on. They would already have long devoured the meat from the mighty one the one tusk had killed. With other games so scarce in this region, with the coming of warmer days, it was only natural they had departed. But somehow he had felt they would wait until he returned, until he brought the ivory that would restore Rab to health. What a dreamer he was, he thought. Why would they think he would return? The tribe never waited for those who separated themselves from it. Kimba slumped down on a rock. What of Rab, so gravely injured? Had they taken him along? Kimba knew well that the tribe would not risk the safety of all for any one individual. Had they left him here then? Had Rab begun his final journey? The boy went to a section of fallen rock at the base of the plateau, which the tribe had set aside as a place of burial. So they did bury their dead. Here, Utrecht would praise the virtue of the fallen one of the tribe, who would be wrapped in ochre-powdered skins with his or her most prized possessions, and then covered with rocks to keep away prowling animals. But the burial place looked as it had when he had left. There was no sign of any new entombment. The boy's heart soared with hope. Perhaps the power had kept Rab alive until the one tusk's ivory could assure his recovery. Which way had the tribe gone? In seasons past, it had more often than not been westward, toward the setting sun. That was the custom, and Kis uh, Kimba could only trust that it was being followed now. In a short while, the cave and the cliff fell far behind. The boy found no evidence of a trail. Soon, hunger began to gnaw at him. He thought yearningly of the valley he had come from and of its vast herds of animals. On these open, undulating meadow marshes, no game was 
to be seen. A vulture with a wingspan as wide as two men are tall flew low. It too was hungry, but it lived off only the carcasses of the dead. Since the boy and the dog still moved, the great bird slowly flapped away. As long as the shadows of late afternoon slanted over the earth, Kimba faced the fact that he might be traveling in the wrong direction. He had no certainty that his tribe had come this way. He had found no prints to indicate their passing. Discouraged, he halted beside a creek that was little more than a thin rivulet of muddy water. He drank deeply. The water tasted sour and brackish. The dog just sniffed at it and walked away. Kimba felt sudden weariness. The day had been exhausting, and he had covered much territory. The dog pounced on something beneath a thicket of brown ferns. Kimba bent to see what it was. There lay a polished replica of a mammoth. Kimba recognized it at once. It was the one, or it was one that Utrecht had fashioned. One he was so proud of that he frequently carried it with him. So it was like a little statue of a mammoth or a mighty one. The sorcerer must have dropped it here. That meant the tribe had passed this way. Then he had come in the right direction. He would catch up with the tribe and soon. Was it his power that had led him this way and that had enabled the dog to find the miniature mammoth? The power had been with him when he had seen in his dreams the notch where the one tusk was headed. It had been with him in that icy underground lake where he almost died. He almost drowned. Or was it Utrecht's power that had guided him to this replica? Just then his vision began to swim. A clammy coldness poured through his body. The creek water, he thought. The dog had refused to touch it. Kimba had been warned many times to be cautious about water that was not fresh and clear. But his thirst had been too great, and his thoughts had been on other matters. His trembling legs would no longer support his body. He sank down to earth, almost unable to move. Have you ever been that sick? Ooh, that's pretty sick. Okay, so he is unable to stand up. He's, he's sick. So he's going to be sick for a while, and we'll see what happens uh, to him when we come back tomorrow. All right? Okay, so tomorrow we'll see what happens. Kimba returned home. Um, nobody was there, and he's going to try to find them. All right. So you guys, in the meantime, take care and enjoy. All right. We'll see you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.